How to Succeed, or Stepping Stones to Fame and Fortune, by Orison Sweat Martin. Chapter 9. Dead in Earnest. It is the live coal that kindles others, not the dead. What made Demosthenes the greatest of all orators was that he appeared the most entirely possessed by the feelings he wished to inspire. The effect produced by Charles Fox, who, by exaggerations of party spirit, was often compared to Demosthenes, seems to have arisen wholly from this earnestness, which made up for want of almost every grace, both of manner and style. Anonymous. Twelve poor men taken out of boats and creeks, without any help of learning, should conquer the world to the cross. Stephen Carnock. For his heart was in his work, and the heart giveth grace unto every art. Longfellow. He did it with all his heart, and prospered. Two Chronicles. The only conclusive evidence of a man's sincerity is that he gives himself for a principle. Words, money, all things else are comparatively easy to give away. But when a man makes a gift of his daily life and practice, it is plain that the truth, whatever it may be, has taken possession of him. Lowell. The emotions, says Whipple, may all be included in the single word enthusiasm, or that impulsive force which liberates the mental power from the ice of timidity as spring loosens the streams from the grasp of winter and sends them forth in a rejoicing rush. The mind of youth, when impelled by this original strength and enthusiasm of nature, is keen, eager, inquisitive, intense, audacious, rapidly assimilating facts into faculties and knowledge into power, and, above all, teeming with that joyous fullness of creative life which radiates thoughts as inspiration and magnetizes as well as informs. Columbus, my hero, exclaims Carlyle, royalist seeking of all. It is no friendly environment this of thine, in the waste deep waters. Around thee, mutinous discouraged souls, behind thee, disgrace and ruin, before thee, the unpenetrated veil of night. Brother, these wild water mountains, bounding from their deep bases, ten miles deep, I am told, are not there on thy behalf. Meseems they have other work than floating thee forward, and the huge winds that sweep from Ursa Major to the tropics and equator, dancing their giant waltz through the kingdoms of chaos and immensity, they care little about filling rightly or filling wrongly the small shoulder of mutton sails in this cockle skiff of thine. Thou art not among articulate speaking friends, my brother, thou art among immeasurable dumb monsters, tumbling, howling wide as the world here. Secret, far off, invisible to all hearts but thine, there lies a help in them. See how thou wilt get at that. Patiently thou wilt wait till the mad sou'wester spend itself, saving thyself by dexterous science of defence the while. Valiantly, with swift decision, thou wilt strike in where the favouring east wind, the possible, springs up. Mutiny of men thou wilt sternly repress. Weakness, despondency, thou wilt cheerily encourage. Thou wilt swallow down complaint, unreason, weariness, weakness of others and thyself. How much wilt thou swallow down? And there shall be a depth of silence in thee, deeper than this sea which is but ten miles deep. A silence unsoundable, known to God only. Thou shalt be a great man. Yes, my world soldier, thou of the world marine service, thou wilt have to be greater than this tumultuous unmeasured world here round thee is. Thou, in thy strong soul, as with a wrestler's arms, shall embrace it, harness it down, and make it bear thee on, to new Americas, or whither God wills. With what concentration of purpose did Washington put the whole weight of his character into the scales of our cause in the Revolution? With what earnest singleness of aim did Lincoln, in the cabinet, Grant, in the field, throw his whole soul into the contest of our civil war? The power of Phillips Brook, at which men wondered, lay in his tremendous earnestness. No matter what your work is, says Emerson, let it be yours. No matter if you are a tinker or preacher, blacksmith or president, let what you are doing be organic. Let it be in your bones, and you open the door by which the affluence of heaven and earth shall stream into you. 
Again, he says, God will not have his works made manifest by cowards. A man is relieved and gay when he has put his heart into his work and done his best. But what he has said or done otherwise shall give him no peace. It is a deliverance which does not deliver. In the attempt, his genius deserts him, no muse befriends, no invention, no hope. I do not know how it is with others when speaking on an important question, said Henry Clay, but on such occasions I seem to be unconscious of the external world. Wholly engrossed by the subject before me, I lose all sense of personal identity, of time, or of surrounding objects. I have been so busy for twenty years trying to save the souls of other people, said Livingston, that I had forgotten that I had one of my own until a savage auditor asked me if I felt the influence of the religion I was advocating. Well, I've worked hard enough for it, said Malibran when a critic expressed his admiration of her D in alt, reached by running up three octaves from low D. I've been chasing it for a month. I pursued it everywhere, when I was dressing, when I was doing my hair, and at last I found it on the toe of a shoe that I was putting on. People smile at the enthusiasm of youth, said Charles Kingsley, that enthusiasm which they secretly look back at with a sigh, perhaps unconscious that it is partly their own fault that they ever lost it. Should I die this minute, said Nelson at an important crisis, want of frigates would be found written on my heart. Said Dr. Arnold, the celebrated instructor, I feel more and more the need of intercourse with men who take life in earnest. It is painful to me to be always on the surface of things. Not that I wish for much of what is called religious conversation, that is often apt to be on the surface. But I want a sign which one catches by a sort of masonry, that a man knows what he is about in life. When I find this, it opens my heart with as fresh a sympathy as when I was twenty years younger. Archimedes, the greatest geometer of antiquity, was consulted by the king in regard to a gold crown suspected of being fraudulently alloyed with silver. While considering the best method of detecting any fraud, he plunged into a full bathing tub, and, with the thought that the water that overflowed must be equal in weight to his body, he discovered the method of obtaining the bulk of the crown compared with an equally heavy mass of pure gold. Excited by the discovery, he ran through the streets undressed, crying, I have found it! Equally celebrated is his remark, Give me where to stand, and I will move the world. His only remark to the Roman soldier who entered his room while engaged in geometrical study was, Don't step on my circle. Refusing to follow the soldier to Marcellus, who had captured the city, he was killed on the spot. He is said to have remarked, My head, but not my circle. Every great and commanding moment in the annals of the world, says Emerson, is the triumph of some enthusiasm. The victories of the Arabs after Muhammad, who in a few years from a small and mean beginning established a larger empire than that of Rome, is an example. They did they knew not what. The naked Dera, horse on an idea, was found an overmatch for a troop of cavalry. The women fought like men and conquered the Roman men. They were miserably equipped, miserably fed, they were temperance troops. There was neither brandy nor flesh needed to feed them. They conquered Asia and Africa and Spain on barley. Caliph Omar's walking stick struck more terror into those who saw it than another man's sword. Horace Vernet's enthusiasm and devotion to one idea of his life knew no bounds. He had himself lashed to the mast in a terrible gale on the Mediterranean, when all others on board were seized with terror, and with great delight sketched the towering waves which threatened every minute to swallow the vessel. Several writers tell the story that a great artist, Giotto, about to paint the crucifixion, induced a poor man to let him bind him upon a cross, in order that he might get a better idea of the terrible scene that he was about to put upon the canvas. He promised faithfully that he would release his model in an hour, but, to the latter's horror, the painter seized a dagger and plunged it into his heart, and while the blood was streaming from the ghastly wound, he painted his death agony. Beecher was a very dull boy and the last member of the family of whom anything was expected. He had a weak memory and disliked study. He shunned society and wanted to go to sea. Even when he went to college, many of his classmates stood ahead of him, who had fallen into oblivion. But when he was converted, his whole life changed. He was full of enthusiasm, hopefulness, and zeal. 
Nothing was too menial for him to undertake to carry his purpose. He chopped wood, built the fire in his little church in Lawrenceburg, Indiana, of only 18 members, cleaned the lamps, swept the floor, and washed the windows. He built the fire, baked, washed when his wife was ill. The pent-up enthusiasm of his ambitious life burst the barriers of his inhospitable surroundings until he blossomed out into America's greatest pulpit orator. When Handel was a little boy, he bought a clavichord, hid it in the attic, and went there at night to play upon it, muffling the strings with small pieces of fine woolen cloth so that the sound should not waken the family. Michelangelo neglected school to copy drawings which he dared not carry home. Murillo filled the margin of his schoolbook with drawings. Dryden read Polybius before he was ten years old. Le Brum, when a boy, drew with a piece of charcoal on the walls of the house. Pope wrote excellent verses at fourteen. Blaise Pascal, the French mathematician, composed at sixteen a tract on the conic sections. Professor Agassiz was so enthusiastic in his work, and so loved the fishes, the fowl, and the cattle, that it is said these creatures would die for him to give them their skeletons. His father wanted him to fit for commercial life, but the fish haunted him day and night. Confucius said that he was so eager in the pursuit of knowledge that he forgot his food, and that in the joys of its attainment he forgot his sorrows, and that he did not even perceive that old age was coming on. The boy that tries to make himself useful, said an employer of the errand boy, George W. Childs. It is this trying to be useful and helpful that promotes us in life. Once when Mr. Harvey, an accomplished mathematician, was in a bookseller's shop, he saw a poor lad of mean appearance enter and write something on a slip of paper and give it to the proprietor. On inquiry, he found this was a poor deaf boy. Kitto, who afterwards became one of the most noted biblical scholars in the world, and who wrote his first book in the poor house. He had come to borrow a book. When a lad, he had fallen backwards from a ladder 35 feet upon the pavement, with a load of slates he was carrying to the roof. The poor lad was so thirsty for books, that he would borrow from booksellers who would loan them to him out of pity, read them, and return them. The youth's companion says that Mr. Edison, in his new biography, his Life and Inventions, describes the accidental method by which he discovered the principle of the phonograph. There is a kind of accident that happens only to a certain kind of man. I was singing to the mouthpiece of a telephone, Mr. Edison says, when the vibrations of the voice sent the fine steel point into my finger. That set me to thinking. If I could record the actions of the point, and send the point over the same surface afterward, I saw no reason why the thing would not talk. I tried the experiment first on a slip of telegraph paper, and found that the point made an alphabet. I shouted the words, Hallo, hallo, into the mouthpiece, ran the paper back over the steel point, and heard a faint, Hallo, hallo, in return. I determined to make a machine that would work accurately, and gave my assistants instructions, telling them what I had discovered. They laughed at me. That's the whole story. The phonograph is the result of the pricking of a finger. It is one thing to hit upon an idea, however, and another thing to carry it out to perfection. The machine would talk, but like many young children, it had difficulty with certain sounds, in the present case with aspirants and syllabants. Mr. Edison's biographers say, but the statement is somewhat exaggerated, he has frequently spent from 15 to 20 hours daily, for six or seven months on a stretch, dinning the word spezia, for example, into the stubborn surface of the wax. Spezia, roared the inventor. Petzia, lisped the phonograph in tones of ladylike reserve, and so on through the thousands of graded repetitions till the desired results were obtained. The primary education of the phonograph was comical in the extreme, to hear those grave and reverend signors, rich in scientific honours, patiently reiterating, Mary had a little lamb, a little lamb, 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 and elaborating that point with anxious gravity, was to receive a practical demonstration of the eternal unfitness of things. Milton, when blind, old, and poor, showed a royal cheerfulness, and never baited one jot of heart or hope, but steered right onward. Dickens's characters seemed to possess him, and haunt him day and night until properly portrayed in his stories. At a time when it was considered dangerous to society in Europe for the common people to read books and listen to lectures on any but religious subjects, 
Charles Knight determined to enlighten the masses by cheap literature. He believed that a paper could be instructive and not be dull, cheap without being wicked. He started the Penny Magazine, which acquired a circulation of 200,000 the first year. Knight projected the Penny Cyclopedia, the library of entertaining knowledge, half hours with the best authors, and other useful books at a low price. His whole adult life was spent in the work of elevating the common people by cheap yet wholesome publications. He died in poverty, but grateful people have erected a noble monument over his ashes. Demosthenes roused the torpid spirits of his countrymen to a vigorous effort to preserve their independence against the designs of an ambitious and artful prince, and Philip had just reason to say he was more afraid of that man than of all the fleets and armies of the Athenians. Horace Greenlee was a hampered genius who never had a chance to show himself until he started the Tribune, into which he poured his whole individuality, life, and soul. Emerson lost the first years of his life trying to be someone else. He finally came to himself and said, If a single man plant himself indomitably on his instincts and there abide, the whole world will come round to him in the end. Though we travel the world over to find the beautiful, we must carry it with us, or we find it not. The man that stands by himself, the universe stands by him also. Take Michelangelo's course, to confide in oneself and be something of worth and value. None of us will ever accomplish anything excellent or commanding, except when he listens to this whisper, which is heard by him alone. Many unknown writers would make fame and fortune if, like Bunyan and Milton and Dickens and George Eliot and Scott and Emerson, they would write down their own lives in their manuscripts, if they would write about things they have seen, that they have felt, that they have known. It is the life thoughts that stir and convince, that move and persuade, that carry their very iron particles into the blood. The real heaven has never been outdone by the ideal. Neither poverty nor misfortune could keep Linnaeus from his botany. The English and Austrian armies called Napoleon the 100,000 man. His presence was considered equal to that force in battle. The lesson he teaches is that which vigour always teaches, that there is always room for it. To what heap of cowardly doubts is not that man's life an answer?